right. Um, so welcome, everyone, um, to the Berman Institute's uh, now virtual now seminar virtual series, seminar series. Um, as a, sort of on behalf of the Berman Institute, um, on behalf of um, the seminar committee, which I chair, and Suzanne and Alan and Casey Humbert, um, members, which sort of welcome up today's speaker, um, Dr. Tim Nekabru. Um, I will do a brief introduction of you, Tim, if that's okay, and then we'll just um, hand it over to you. So, okay, cool. Uh, so, um, and just, just I know you're aware, but we have the various folks in, in the, who are participating today are from the Berman Institute and also from other parts, hopefully, of the university. Um, we, shared, we shared your talk with colleagues, including colleagues at the Center for Language and Speech Processing. I know they're oh, cool. quite interested in your work. So um, with that, I'll just introduce Timna briefly, our speaker. So Dr. Gebru uh, co-leads the Ethical Artificial Intelligence Research Team at Google. Um, where she works to reduce the potential negative impact or risk of, uh, associated with AI. Um, she earned her doctorate um, under supervision of Fei-Fei Li at Stanford University and did a postdoc at Microsoft's research uh, office in New York City um, in their FATE team. I think you'll have to tell us what FATE is. I think I have a suspicion, but um, just love to hear. Um, she's also um, the co-founder of an organization called Black in AI. Um, which is a place for sharing of ideas and fostering collaboration um, amongst um, individuals who are black and who are interested in artificial intelligence. Um, so that's just sort of a brief overview, Timnit, of, of I think you can fill in any details that you'd like, but um, we're delighted to have you here today to give a talk on applying rigor to data collection and machine learning, uh, considerations in fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. Awesome. Thanks for that introduction. I don't have anything to add. Um, FATE is um, Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics um, um, and in AI. I believe that's the, that's the acronym for the MSR, Microsoft Research Group in New York. Um, so I guess, I don't know how you do it usually. Like, do, you, do we take questions in yeah, the middle? Yeah, sorry, I, mean, I should have said. I'm okay um, taking questions in the middle, but I don't know if that's too... Um, difficult usually, usually we just world. let you go and then and then try to save about 15 minutes at the end if possible for discussion so okay we'll, cool. we'll keep an eye on the clock and let you know yeah I just I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock it's like so what I've noticed in these virtual things is that my screen is full screen and unless I have my phone with like a stopwatch on me or, or something I I don't see the time and like um, I don't see presenter notes or anything like that show me how many how yeah. long um, I'm spending on each side so like if you can give me like a, you know, like a, I don't know, like a 20 sure. minute, 30 minute warning and that's how yep. we can do that. Okay, cool. Um, so I, uh, so I wanted to talk about, um, you know, applying rigor um, for, and, and data, just anything related to data and machine learning. Um, and um, I think the, the, the talk I, I wanted, to, in this talk, I wanted to focus on this one paper I wrote with Un Sojo who's a PhD student at Stanford, and she's a historian. She's a PhD student in history, and she's, she's an archivist. Um, and so I, one of the, the central kind of things that I wanted to say is how it's important to learn from other disciplines who deal with data. Um, and so this paper was presented at FACT, which is um, a conference on fairness, accountability, transparency, and social, socio-technical um, systems. Uh, and so it was presented in February, right before this whole thing, for me at least. So that was my last kind of travel. I was there at the conference in Barcelona, and then, uh, and then I came back here. Um, and this conference is a conference I, I've been very involved in. I was in the, and just until recently, I was in the founding executive committee, which is basically like the board that, of the conference. And so like who, you know, it's the body that determines um, who the program chairs are, where we should hold the conference, what the content should be, that kind of stuff. Um, and it was, it was a conference that, um, I mean, honestly, like there's a lot of, a lot of work, a, a lot of papers I've written where I don't really know where else they would be, um, where else they would be published really. So one example 
is, um, let me just, oh, so, oh, yeah, so, so I, I forgot to say this. So, I mean, the whole point of this whole talk is that many issues that we discuss in, in the conference and in many other um, areas now of AI, um, many issues of fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics, they're rooted in decisions surrounding the data collection. It's not just data collection, right? Data collection, annotation, ownership, who owns the data, who doesn't, who has a say, these kinds of things. Um, but I find that, in, I mean, ever since I got into this field uh, when I was doing a PhD, um, things are around data collection or things around data in general in my field are not really respected as much. You know, like, let's say you have a new data set, everybody's like, oh, that's just a data set paper or, you know, like you, you need to have some sort of, I don't know, clever algorithmic component. And, uh, um, and, and so one of the, the points I, I want to make here is, is why um, data is so important and how we, why we should pay attention to it. So the conference I was talking about fact, um, and I, I was saying that like, there are many papers I have, um, works I have that I, I don't know where else they would be presented. And so this is one, one paper that I wrote two years ago with my colleague, Joy Bulamini. And the way this work started was that um, it, it was it was originally um, Joy's master's thesis, and so you know we partnered up. Um, she had been doing some a uh, similar line of work for a while, and um, she wanted to work with someone with computer vision expertise. And um, we partnered up and we worked on it. I had basically advised her master's thesis, and. Um, we wrote, you know, she wrote her master's thesis and I, I really didn't think that, I, I didn't really know where we would publish it. Like I didn't know if this thing was publishable or not. And so then when we started the fact conference, I was like, oh, this, this, this seems like a place where we could um, publish this work. I really couldn't figure out <laughs> any other place we could publish it. So this work was, um, so th this work was basically showing the disparities and error rates between uh, people who have, uh, Mo the, the largest disparity with people was between people who have um, uh, darker skin, um, people who are darker skin women and lighter skin men. So the disparities in error rates that we looked at were specifically gender classification systems. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, the way this whole thing started was that Joy was doing some random art project and she found that, um, you know, she wanted to use open source face detection system for some reason. And she found that it wouldn't detect her face. It would detect her roommate's face, um, but not her face. And so when she puts in a white mask, it would detect her face, but not when she doesn't put on a white mask. So we decided to do a systematic analysis of, um, of um, face-based you know, systems, automated facial, facial analysis systems. So um, we, one of the things we looked at was these gender classification systems. And... What, what are these gender classification systems? They look at a picture of a face and they tell you whether uh, the face is that of a man or a woman. Um, so these are binary gender classification systems. In fact, we call them gender, they ascribe a gender, right? And so many of these systems, um, they don't, they have lots of issues, for, ex um, for example, which I'll talk about, but like um, one of them is, is the task of gender recognition itself. Um, why does it exist? Is it useful? What kind of harms does it pose to spe especially um, communities um, in the trans community? Um, another one is they, you know, these systems don't uh, di distinguish between um, sex labels or and gender labels, for example. Um, but one, what, but the, the issue we found was that, so if you look at um, this chart right here, so we looked at th three different um, APIs, and so these are commercially based APIs that we pay for, uh, right, like they're out there, um, Microsoft, Face++, and IBM, and if you look at the accuracy, um, random chance would be 50%, right, so if I have 50% accuracy, it's just random, I'm, I'm just guessing, so um, we used, here we are classifying the um, skin type, by using something called um, Fitzpatrick skin type classification system. It's used by dermatologists. So if you look at type one is the lightest and type six is the darkest. And for, for type six women, you see that the, the error rates really uh, approach random, random chance, especially for IBM and face plus plus. Excuse me. So this paper came out and 
there were a wide range of reactions to this paper. Uh, I want to go next. Where is my arrow? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So um, one of the, the changes was that Microsoft um, changed the uh, training data. So we, I mean, we knew that the, these disparities were because of the training data. Uh, because a lot of um, a lot of companies, the way they train anything related to cases is they download a lot of images from the web. And so when you look at images from the web, and we talk a lot about this um, uh, in, in our paper, there's a disparity on who's represented, who's not represented. And so if you train uh, your, your automated facial analysis algorithm based on that data, you're going to reproduce the disparities that you see in that data. Um, another thing that we brought up in this paper is the importance of intersectional testing. So, and the importance of moving, uh, well, the importance of looking at things that are a little bit more objective than race. You know, race is a social construct. It's, it's unstable across time and space. You know, uh, how I'm racially classified here in the States is different from another place. It's, it's different across time. Um, and many people have written about this. And so one characteristic that we looked at is skin type, and there's other characteristics that other people can look at. Um, and so when we look at some of these, um, the ways in which people responded, I'm just making sure I look at time. Um, so Microsoft, um, they said, oh, we improved facial recognition technology. It now uh, performs well across skin to tones and gender. So you don't see this disparity in error rate that we reported. Um, IBM said that um, in, re in, in response to our uh, work, they released this diversity in faces data set to advance the study of fairness in facial recognition systems. Um, and then Amazon uh, was, uh, might finally be audited. And then um, senators like Kamala Harris um, wrote letters to the FBI asking them to investigate the use of face recognition systems um, by law enforcement, citing our study. And then, of course, there's much more that happened since then. Like last year, um, San Francisco and Oakland banned the use of face recognition systems by law enforcement um, and, and many other things. Um, there were other legislation that there was other legislation that's um, proposed, et cetera. Now, let's look at some of these responses, right? So IBM Research, for example, released diversity in faces data set to advance the study of fairness in facial recognition systems. And then they took down this data set recently. So another issue is many people in computer vision, many, including my, a lot of researchers, we used um, the Flickr data set um, to uh, train our, our systems. And while the Flickr data set has licensing that allows you to use it, you have to imagine when people upload data, people upload pictures of their family themselves, you know, um, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago or whatever, they're not imagining that it's going to be used to train a face recognition system uh, later on. So what does it mean um, to have consent, right? So that this, this raises issues of what does it mean to have consent? Um, secondly, you know, Microsoft improves facial recognition technology to perform well across um, skin tones and genders. Um, again, um, there are works that I'll talk about later that describe the harms that are caused by automatic gender recognition systems, right? So it doesn't mean, fairness does not mean just that, that does not just include um, making sure that whatever product you're making, X, performs well across different groups. Even the way in which you try to assure that happens can create other problems. Um, and then even if something works perfectly across different groups, it can still be used in ways that are not fair. Um, so for example, this was an example where uh, people were trying to uh, follow our advice from our paper, right? So what we said was um, look at you know, skin tone and look at how dark it is, um, how light it is based on the Fitzpatrick um, skin type classification system. Make sure your training data is balanced. Make sure that you test intersectionally. Now, while trying to test intersectionally, while trying to create evaluation data and trying to determine how the disparities in error rates, there was this um, contractor, I guess, um, by Google, where um, you know people were trying to get uh, data from darker-skinned individuals 
um, because they are underrepresented in, in the web. But it was done in a, in a manner that was a little bit dubious. Um, and so you, you can read more about it if, if you're interested in, in, this, in this news headline. So this is while people are trying to create products that are quote unquote more fair. Um, another issue while trying to determine and make products that are more fair um, or test for the disparity of error rates in automated facial analysis tools the way Joy and I did is that NIST was the government was using um, images from again of people without their consent and from the most vulnerable in our population. So let's say people were, who are looking immigrants, people are looking for visas, um, people who are arrested. And going back to um, the task itself of automatic, uh, automated gender recognition, um, so at Google, at Google, we don't have uh, an API that um, just gives you the gender. Uh, we don't have automated um, gender recognition. And we wrote about why uh, we don't do that. Um, and so this this talk, Counting the Countless, it's actually a critique of my paper. Well, uh, part of it is a critique of the paper that I, I talk, told you about, um, Joy and I's paper, um, where we analyze the, the performance of automatic gender recognition. This paper talks about what categorization itself does um, and who uh, it affects and how. Um, so the act of categorizing people into men, women and um, non-binary individuals while you're doing it, you know, the, the person who is um, creating these categories, um, what, what is their, uh, we have to ask, why are they doing it and why do they want to use these categories for? And is it in the, to the benefit of the groups of people that are categorized? In fact, there is a book called um, Sorting Things Out. It's about scientific, it's, it's about categorization in science in general. And it, when it became a thing and um, it, it, how it changed science. So I think it's a really interesting book. Um, so this, this talks about, again, the task itself and how we should think about whether or not a specific task should exist in the first place. Um, again, looking at, you know, I think the, po the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not, fairness is not just about having more diverse data sets and making sure that your error rates, that the disparities in error rates are, um, const are, don't, you know, are constant across subgroups. So for example, here is another example where people are trying to improve the accuracy of face recognition, um, but they're doing this by harvesting um, Zimbabwean faces for um, training data. And a, and a lot of the, the citizens don't know that their faces are being harvested when they're walking around the streets or when they go when they're going to uh, take public transportation. They don't have a say whether they want this uh, data about them to be harvested or not. So to recap, um, sometimes uh, the most important thing is to make sure that there aren't disparate error rates across different groups, subgroups. So let's say, you know, people who are uh, under 20 uh, darker skin women or over, uh, you know, between 50 and 60 uh, lighter skin men or however you want to define the subgroups, that's a whole other different thing, how to define these subgroups. Um, in fact, there is a Twitter handle called Brown Skin Matters that discusses how a lot of different um, uh, skin disease in dermatology are discussed in terms of how they affect lighter skin. So some of my colleagues, one of my colleagues was telling me that, you know, she has a very, a son who is very dark skin, has some skin issues, and they have issues identifying what kind of issues or problems he's having because many of the ways in which um, these skin problems are defined are defined with respect to people with lighter skin. So if your goal is to do something like automated, you know, melanoma detection or something else, of course, the most important thing is to make sure that there aren't disparate error rates across subgroups. But sometimes it's not about um, having disparate error rates across subgroups. Sometimes the particular task just should not exist, right? So one example is automatic gender recognition. Question is, why does it even exist in the first place? Um, 
why, you know, many times we see that it's used in targeted advertising, maybe to automatically predict someone's um, gender and then show them specific types of advertisement. But people like Morgan Claus Schremerman, for example, have written uh, a lot about this. One paper is called Gender Reduction, uh, Gender Recognition or Gender Reduction. Um, and it talks about how the harms that automatic gender uh, recognition can do to people and trans communities. Um, sometimes uh, there might not be an issue in the task itself, but the way the technology is used, uh, the way the tool is used can be a problem because who it, it's, it's based on who is using it on whom and who has the power to use it on whom, right? It's not a two-way street. So who has the data and the ability to train powerful models versus who is subjected to those models? It's not an equal um kind of division and so so one example uh because uh a lot of my work had to do with automated facial analysis is you know people ask me why why do i worry about um face recognition like people can recognize people's faces so why why don't we have machines doing it and so this is um an example that we have in our paper um and this was during world war ii and People were, th this was a guide on how to differentiate between Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans because we want to target Japanese Americans, but we don't want to target Chinese Americans. So this, this is um, what was going on at the time. And right now, this is happening at scale, right? So technology, basically, it's a tool. And that tool is used in how it's that how we use that tool is defined by us, right? So at that time, people individually were trying to distinguish between Chinese and Japanese Americans so that we can target, so that people can target one group of people unfairly. And this can be can be done at scale uh, using face recognition, right? So now instead of individuals trying to target people you can do it using face recognition at scale. So that's happening, right? Right now, Muslim minorities are being targeted uh, using automated facial analysis tools. And this is a case in which it's not really about whether or not you have disparate error rates, whether or not it, it works perfectly, um, it's still a very harmful thing to do. Um, and we, we don't have to go to China, right? Um, there is this, um, a report called the Perpetual Lineup by the Center for um, Privacy and Security at Georgetown Law uh, that talked about the fact that one in two American ad adults is in a law enforcement uh, database, and it can be this database can use can be used by by uh, law enforcement in whatever way they want. They can perform searches in whatever way they want because there is no there are no rules uh, um, or laws um, kind of. Uh, making it such that they have to tell us when and how they're using this database, how they're collecting it, what it consists of, etc. Um, in fact, there was a actually a much uh, a more recent um, uh, report by the same people, and in this report, they even talk about a misuse of these kinds of search systems. So, for example. Let's say you have a nearest neighbor system where you, you put in a, a, a picture of, of someone and it gives you back uh, the faces of the five people who look most like this person or something like that. And so they were trying to use it, um, people, law enforcement were trying to use the system to find suspects. And so the way they would, so one case, um, they couldn't remember, they didn't have a photo of the suspect. Um, so what they said was, oh, um, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look up, um, you know, this person looks like Woody Harrison. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look up, take a, find a picture of Woody Harrison and Photoshop Woody Harrison's um, eyes, because the person's eyes look different. We're gonna put this into the system and we're gonna find the nearest neighbors to this picture that we put in the system. And then we're gonna go um, question and target those people that this system um, gives us back. So there's a few issues here. That's not how the system was meant to be used. And so now you're going to be infringing on uh, people's rights, these, these five people that are uh, uh, sent to you uh, by this um, system, by this neighbor's, uh, nearest neighbor system, um, even though you don't know if, if uh, these are the people like who you should be going after. 
And so there's a lot of issues with, you know, th this is this is what SDS call people scholars call like a socio technical system, right? When you look at technology, um, we shouldn't just look at the actual technology, you know, in in isolation, right? We should look at it as part of a social system and analyze who's building the technology, who is deploying it, how is it being used, and who is benefiting from it versus who's not benefiting from it. So in this case, it was interesting because after the first, um, the first report, the perpetual lineup, the Center for Privacy and, um, and um, uh, I always forget the security, the Center for Privacy and Security at George Law, they decided they were gonna um, ask for regulation around face recognition. They didn't ask for a moratorium uh, by, uh, of, of um, law, law enforcement using face recognition. But after the second one, after this particular um, report, they asked for a moratorium um, on the use of face recognition by law enforcement um, until you know more regulation is passed and we understand more how they're using it and what kind of documentation is in place. Um, and then of course, like later, you know, in May actually, that's when last year May is when um, San Francisco passed um, uh, a ban in Oakland, and I, I'm not sure if. Um, Somerville, Mass there, there were discussions in Somerville, Massachusetts. I don't know if it's passed and like a whole bunch of um, cities and states are um, discussing it or passing laws against it. Hey, Tim, so, just to let you know, you have about uh, 20 minutes remaining. What? Sorry. <laughs> We're we wanted okay. to re retain some time for just- That uh, is, 20, oh, tw wait, 25. 20 minutes to talk, right? Not for the whole thing? Correct, or, correct, correct, yeah. Okay, okay, well, that's fine, that's fine. Whew. All right. <laughs> I thought I had to like wrap up in five minutes, you know? No, sorry. Um, okay, okay. No, no, that's fine. That's okay. That's, that, that's, 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 that's fine. Um, yeah, that, that sounds good. I think I hopefully will be done before then. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, it, it, so I, I said that we should look at um, technology as a socio-technical system, right? And so one of those is um, who is building it and who is being affected by it, right? So. This was one um, kind of a, pay, a news story last year um, where they were talking about Amazon's face recognition system and how it's uh, being, they're selling it um, to law enforcement and how, and, um, uh, oh, did I talk? Oh, I, I don't have this picture, sorry. But like they're using it on, on law enforcement, they're selling it to law enforcement, but actually a follow-up paper to gender shades, to the paper I discussed uh, that I wrote with Joy Bolamini. So Joy Bolamini and uh, Deb, Deborah Raji uh, wrote this follow-up paper showing that Amazon's face recognition system has the same kind of um, biases that uh, we showed in gender shades. And the moment that paper was out and it was um, covered by the New York Times and everything, VP after VP started going after Joy and, um, and Deb. And I mean, like me and my call, uh, my colleague um, Meg uh, wrote a letter and assembled a whole bunch of computer vision experts, um, wrote an open letter to Amazon kind of uh, defending um, the work of our colleagues and people wrote it, like people signed it, like, um, Turing Award, you know, like Joshua, Benjo, and, and a whole bunch of other people. And, and so then they kind of were, they backed down a little bit because they couldn't say, they couldn't say anything more, but they were trying to at attack the technical integrity of the work. But the point here is, um, so we have to look at who's building this technology and who is um, negatively impacted by it, right? So this was a conference um, called iClear. And, you know, um, iClear was virtual this year. Uh, it was supposed to be held in Ethiopia this year. Um, for the, it was supposed to be held in Africa for the first um, time. And except we had a global pandemic, so we couldn't hold it in Africa for the first time. But that was in the works for like two years. I, I worked really hard to convince them to bring it to Africa. And because I knew that this room would have looked very different, right? So this is a room and I can't, uh, point, you know, I can't really find that many women, like I, ha I can see two, um, you know, you know, the point I'm trying to make here, right? This is a group of people who are discussing the um, state of the art technology and all that, doing the research. And really in the US, this is the group of people who are being negatively impacted. 
um, by the technology. And the intersection between these two groups is really low. Um, and why is this important? I want to give you an example. Um, for example, um, so I, I founded this, this, this group. I co-founded this group, Black and AI, with my colleague, Radita Bebe. And so Deborah Raji, who showed that there was um, uh, Amazon's face, rec uh, face recognition system had disparities in error rates, the same disparities in error rates that um, Joy and I showed in gender shades. She almost quit, the, she was going to quit the tech industry as a whole uh, because of discrimination and isolation. And she told me that um, until she came to Black and AI, um, she was always walking into rooms like this um, and she felt very isolated. She never saw herself represented. And um, she came to Black and AI and she's now, you know, thriving. And she's one of the few people who took, who put her career on the line to show these kinds of issues. Um, that technology has on our community. And um, she worked for impact, right? It wasn't just about publishing the paper. We called on Amazon to stop selling um, face recognition um, to law enforcement. So I just wanted to note this because for me, my work is, is it's kind of because I see, like I said, tech as a socio-technical system, uh, I don't see my work as just like, you know, the math part or the coding part or whatever. I, I think all of the things I do for me is, um, is part of my research. Um, and, but, but so like, when I started working with Joy on Gender Shades, um, this issue of bias and fairness was not really something that people talked about. Um, it wasn't really uh, something that, uh, it was hard to describe to people like why I thought it was important or anything like this. But now, um, now it is seen as important, but then the same mistakes are being made because the people whose faces are being represented in ethics board or talking about fairness and bias, once again, don't represent the people who are being negatively impacted by the, by the technology. Um, so th these are some, some of the things we should be thinking about. Now, this was all to say that um, fairness, accountability, transparency encompasses many, many, many things, and each of them are very, very complex. Um, in fact, um, the, this paper by Ken Holstein and his collaborators um, talked about surveyed industry practitioners, and they talked about, uh, they say, you know, while fair ML literature has largely focused on quote unquote debiasing methods and viewed the training data as fixed. Most of our interviewees report that their teams consider data collection rather than model development as the most important place to intervene, right? So there are many things, uh, many issues we think we should think about surrounding um, the data development, annotation, and ownership process, as I said earlier. Um, and so one of the things that I think is really important is that we need a specialty in machine learning that just deals with, with these issues. And we don't, I don't feel like we teach that in classes or treat it as a fundamental part of our scientific publications. Um, so I, I think that like the, the stuff I, I hoped to have covered <laughs> earlier is that there are many issues that have to do with data that are complex. So one of them is consent, one of them is power, inclusivity, representation, subgroup classification. So the whole idea of um, so people on my team, Alex Tan and Emily Denton, just wrote a paper on the critical race theory approach to fairness, where they talk about just classifying race and gender. Um, and if you do that and, and, do, uh, and apply the uh, techniques that we talk about in fairness, what kind of issues you might um, face. Um, privacy, ethics, um, and, and transparency. Um, so I already said this. So, um, like I said, we need to have an interdisciplinary approach, but, but we can learn from disciplines like anthropology and history. So our paper was about history, but this, this, I highly recommend this um, blog post by Ali Al-Khatib, who is, was a PhD student in HCI, but um, used to be an anthropologist before that, and he looks at the parallels between anthropology and, and AI, and how uh, people in anthropology had shared concerns um, and and faced similar issues, like for example, the government was throwing money at anthropologists um, a, a, a while ago, uh, and, and many other issues. So I highly recommend this um, blog post. So going back to archives, archives are the oldest attempt to gather human data. 
right? Um, so, so what are archives? Um, there are, uh, again, uh, they, they can range from uh, ones that are like, uh, that are uh, owned by the government, um, like, you know, they all have an institutional mission of a uh, slash agenda. So there's like uh, public ones like UN archives, there are private ones like Rockefeller. And, um, and then there is this, this um, uh, well, there's the US Department one, which is a, a, a one example. But then there is this um, internet archive. So for example, so the, so the internet archive, so most archives have a procedure for determining relevance and scope of like, so for each document, uh, what's the procedure for determining whether I should have this document in the archive versus not. In internet archive, um, they're just trying to archive the, the internet. So the bigger is better. So they're not, they don't really have a procedure to determine what to archive versus what to not. And apparently historians are worried about this particular period of time that we're in because even though we have a lot of data, you think you have a lot of data uh, based on the internet, um, we're not systematically archiving it. And so um, it, it turns out I was told that um, historians are worried about this time. So this, this um, internet archive, it, it seems very kind of similar to how we get machine learn uh, data and training data machine learning these days, right? Bigger is better. So um, in our work uh, on Sonjo and me, we, um, we basically classify, we, we say that there's a spectrum in data collection, right? There's the wild, wild west spectrum and curational data collection spectrum. And we're not saying that any of these, we're not saying that each of these ends is the best one. We're just saying that we should understand that there's a spectrum and understand where we are in this spectrum. So the wild, wild west is basically, I believe, where we are now, which is where we just try to ingest all the data that we have. And the curational data collection is where, uh, where the archives are, right? And they're driven by um, collection initiatives and agendas. Uh, a university archive has said that. Now, I would argue that our data collection is also driven by, you know, collection initiatives and agendas. You know, this group of people wants to make money. This group of people wants to study this other group of people from their particular um, uh, point of view. Uh, this group of people want to develop a state of the art um, technology. But I don't think many times we don't we don't think about um, what our initiatives and agendas are. We assume that we don't have an initiative or agenda. Um, so here, there is many differences between the Wild Wild West and the curational data collection spectrum. So there's the level of supervision is different. Um, whereas in, in this one spec, you know, the Wild Wild West spectrum, we don't really have any supervision, right? We're trying to ingest as much data as we can. In the curational data collections, there are curators that are full-time staff and they determine what um, should, what kind of the data, what story the data should tell basically. The objectives are different, right? Like um, in curational data collection, it's about preserving me memory. Um, it's not necessarily about making money. Um, the audience is different. Um, there's a limited scholarly audience for curational data collection, a wider consumer audience for, um, for our uh, wild, wild west uh, spectrum. And then again, of course, the feedback is really fast. Um, we want it to be really fast in tech, and but one of the things that I advocate for is being a little bit slower. Um, and then curational data collections um, is very slow. So our, basically our argument is that we need to be a little bit more interventionist um, in this spectrum in machine learning and, and we need to understand what that means. And we need to, we need to carefully under, um, document um, our procedures. We need, to care, we need to have a specific data um, uh, gathering policy and we need to understand that we do have an agenda and, and pinpoint what that agenda is rather than pretending that we don't have an agenda. Um, so we call the this particular part like laissez-faire, we call the other part interventionist. So archi archivists, archives, um, like I said, they don't just gather data, right? they first have a plan on how to do it and that plan is from macro to micro. So it starts with a mission statement. What's the goal of this um, data set? What, where, what are we trying to accomplish? Then based on the mission statement, there is a collection development policy that's created, how to collect the data. Then there's an appraisal process that determines how each um, collected document should be, um, you know, determine whether we should um, 
keep this uh, document versus not. And then there is additional processing that happens. Um, so the mission statement, again, is the highest level of the agenda formulation. Then again, like I said, there's a collection development policy, appraisal, and then processing and indexing. Uh, let me just see time. Okay. So this is just to show you that there are shared concerns between archives and what the kinds of things we're talking about. For example, the fact that the digitization can reinforce cultural um, stereotypes. Um, and that uh, there is um, the, the fact that um, what, what this person said, you know, the archive is not a piece of data, but a status. And that's actually true for human centered data too. How you're represented in a data set and training data is the status, uh, is a status, right? Like who is more likely to be considered a criminal, for example, based on specific data. Um, that's the status that you have. Um, okay, so what are some, a few models that can be, that's a few specific examples of models um, that can be transferred to the machine learning settings from archives. So I just wanna briefly touch on those. So for example, I talked about data ownership, right? And so one of the issues is that big companies, I work at Google, um, own a lot of data and smaller individuals, nonprofits, companies don't own a lot of data. And now there is some conversations um, in the EU, for example, about data consortiums and the archives have had data consortiums. So they, they form consortia across smaller, it's like partnerships between smaller and larger institutions, maybe across um, nations, across continents. This allows them to pull resources together and um, pull resources together and increase the representation, um, representation in their data. And also um, basically like spend less money and get uh, more resources. So this is, uh, even though, so we're starting to talk, I feel like we're starting to talk about a lot of these things. It's almost like reinventing the wheel, but probably we should look at how they made data consortiums work before we work on data consortiums. Another one is representation. So I talked about categorization a lot earlier. So one example, for example, is that if you look at um, sentiment analyzers, right? If you look at a, 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 a sentence, um, that, that has, um, and you know, sentiment analyzers look at a sentence and they say whether the sentence is positive or negative. And we find that sentences that have any mention of LGBTQ plus uh, identity or, and many uh, mentions of, for example, disability or something like this, um, are automatically, are, um, you know, scored less negative than those that don't. So we did some perturbation analysis in our, in our team. There's a few papers that we have there. We saw that. And one of the things that people in our team did is they had a, a project called Project Respect that allowed LGBTQ plus communities, people in those communities, to um, have sentences that describe them in a manner in which they want to be described. So like positive representations of people in this community so that we have more instances of them in our training data. Now in archives, this has been a huge problem with one group of people studying, um, doing archiving another group of people. And if you're going into a particular community and you're archiving, you're uh, documenting them from your perspective, um, obviously, there's going to be huge biases there. And so a lot of communities decided that they want their own open-ended way of preserving their own languages and cultures. And so this is called Mukurtu. This is one example of this is Mukurtu. Another one is History Pin. Um, and so how can we transfer this um, into our setting? So for example, when we, a lot of times we do data annotation using, you know, crowdsourcing, for example, like Amazon Mechanical Turk or something like this. And we don't allow open-ended ways of many times. We don't have open-ended manners of annotating data. So perhaps we can learn from some of um, these uh, tools and these groups of people on how to create uh, tools where communities can um, annotate their own data in a manner that they think is appropriate. Third one I want to talk about is code of conduct. So a lot of um, teams right now, a lot of companies have um, you know, AI principles like Google has, um, many, many sort of principles. And the question is, um, and the, there's a partnership in AI. The question is, how are these enforced? Like, what, <laughs> what, what is enforcing these codes of conduct, you know? 
Um, is it really working? Is it doing anything? A lot of people don't have faith in them. In archives, um, I think there's something we can learn from archives. In archives, each person, each archivist has to be a uh, part of a, a society, right? Like, and so if you you're, remember their full time, their job is to gather data full time. And, um, and, they, and then each institution they work in has to be part of this, um, th there is a code of conduct for the institution across institutions and for the individual. So there's many layers of, 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 of the things, codes of conduct. Um, and so I think that this is something that we should maybe think about in our setting as well. Um, finally, you know, uh, appraisal is a very big, uh, you know, appraisal gives a lot of power to the person who is doing appraisal. So what is appraisal? It's like determining which uh, documents should be um, selected to be put in the archive versus not. Um, one example is, for example, there's guidelines for writing an appraisal report. So here is an example, like you should write the background information, the type of agency who's collecting the data, the annual budget, et cetera. Like there's many other things. But what's really interesting is um, I wrote a paper with my collaborators called Data Sheets for Datasets, um, saying that people, it's, a, it's kind of like a workflow um, for uh, gathering and annotating data, but also like documentation, like saying that people should document uh, many things about the data creation process after they're done with the data set. And so this was like motivation for data set creation. There's a whole bunch of other things, but I didn't know at the time that the archives have been doing this appraisal process and that there are guidelines for uh, appraisal. So I feel like we were trying to reinvent the wheel here. Um, we also, um, right, so like, you know, describing the data set, like distribution of age, skin type, et cetera. We also did, uh, uh, and so this, this data sheets was actually inspired by another field, which is electronics, where every component has a data sheet associated with it that talks about the non-idealities of, um, of the component, right? This is another instance of learning from another discipline. Um, similarly, we had a paper called Model Cards for Mo Model Reporting along those lines. And um, to talk about the limitation, you know, to describe what kind of testing you've done a model. Um, here's an example. Um, at Google, there's a, a, a model card for like a, a model in production. So uh, if you go to modelcards with google.com, you can see a specific example. There is one for object detection. So look at the limitations, performance, you know, what's the input, what's the output, et cetera. So this is kind of, this is very related to what people do in archives, whereas extensive documentation about your process. Um, but we, again, we didn't know any of this work where, uh, when, we, when we did this um, model cars and data sheets and all that. And then finally, you know, um, they think about how to increase representation in their data, how to get the long tail. So look at, for example, how we do, uh, how, how we get data, right? Like we are limited by the, we, we start from the source. We're like, okay, let's look at Reddit. And then let's, you know, Reddit has a lot of data. So we train a language model on, on Reddit. Well, what kind of biases does Reddit have, right? Whereas if we had a collection development policy, we can say, hey, what are we, what, is the, what are the characteristics of Reddit data? What are we missing? What's our goal? Oh, sorry. So then um, can, we, can we partner with organizations to uh, access more, to get more data, to increase representation? So here is an example where uh, people have done this. They have, for example, um, partnered with um, Lighthouse for the Blind to increase um, the uh, data uh, representation of blind people. And so those are some of the things we can learn. Anyways, I will conclude now. <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, we'll still have time for questions. So I... The point I really wanted to make with my talk was this. There are many ways in which societal biases enter. What is when we formulate what problems to work on? What problems, what research questions are we answering? Maybe purely because of curiosity or purely because of what we think is important. Both are, both are biased. If you don't have representation in your set of researchers you're all, and you have curiosity-driven research, it's only curiosity of a select few in the world. If Again, if it's... Um, research based on what you think is important, it's only what a few people in the world think are, um, are important. Um, and then it's like I showed earlier, there's a huge disparity between the people who are doing the research and the people who are being negatively impacted by the technology. 
And if we don't, uh, if we have that disparity, we're gonna perpetuate societal biases. Then there is like biases when you collect training and evaluation data, which, um, which I talked about. Then of course there's um, when we architect our models and loss functions. And then when we analyze how our models are used in society, which means, you know, what does it mean that a, cert a certain model is working? Who gets to decide whether this thing is working properly versus not? And how do we test whether something is working versus not? What does it mean to that something is working? But at least in my field, many of the papers and incentives and, and, and classes and everything just basically talk about how we architect our models and loss functions or you know, they don't talk about all of these other things that we've discussed. Um, and so I think that uh, we should change that and that we should learn from other disciplines that have looked at data much more rigorously. And um, we should work with them. I mean, we should do, we should work in a truly interdisciplinary manner um, to draw lessons for, uh, from those other disciplines. And so I, I worked on history because I was working with a historian, but there are many other, uh, and then, you know, my prior work with Joy drew on um, ideas from critical race theory, um, but there's many other disciplines we could um, work with. With that, thank you. And if you have questions, let me know. Thank you very much, uh, Timnit, for this, for the really um, interesting talk. Um, we, we have, we do have some time for questions. We have about eight, nine minutes. So um, maybe I'll just before, I have a couple of questions myself, but before I get to that, maybe I'll just open it up and see if anyone on uh, today's webinar would like to raise a question. And you can do so either in the chat box or by um, unmuting yourself. Oh, I'm looking at a, uh, actually someone, Stephanie, is it? Yeah. Wrote a, a question. I don't know, Stephanie, if you'd like to, to share your question verbally, you're welcome to, or I could read it out. Okay, I'm just asking a, a selfish question as a neuroscientist. Um, we're trying to put together a conference on uh, artificial intelligence uh, focused for our neuroethics society meeting. So I just wanted to probe you. I like um, all the different ethical values you discussed, um, consent, power, subgroup classification, privacy, transparency. Um, do you think any special issues arise when it comes to biological data like brain data? I'm asking kind of oh, specifically because of its role in personality and our decision making. Um, so just right off, just kind of without giving it so much thought, I would, I think that, I think that all of the things I talked about directly transfer. I don't know if there is something new, but they, you know, so like ownership of data is, is a huge thing there, right? Like, and, and again, like, yeah, what does, what does work, what does it mean for something to work versus not? I, I honestly think like it's just directly transferable um, when I'm thinking about it right now. And I found that actually it's very interesting. When I talked to people in medicine, I felt like they were much more advanced in their thinking um, about this than a lot of us in machine learning or AI or whatever. And, I, I, and maybe that's because um, people in medicine have had to think about this for such a long time. It's been such a, an ingrained part of their education and their practice. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't really know. I think all of these are important in the setting that you're describing, like transparency, privacy, um, power. I, I can't say that one of them is, stands out more than the other is when I'm thinking about it. Yeah, um, I, I thought the same thing, but I just wanted to kind of get your take. Um, I'm, I'm in mental health research too with schizophrenia, so the power, um, <laughs> that part of it, I think, kind of really can come into it in some interesting ways. Yeah, absolutely. Are there other questions or comments? And while we're waiting, I'll, I'll ask a question. So I, I found your um, discussion of the harms of categorization to be really um, relevant and effect important, um, you know, and thinking about this issue more, it seems like this has come up in multiple different contexts. You know, it was a, a lively discussion about categorization around the US census. Um, there's been other kinds of discussions related to this. Um, and yet we're sort of expecting researchers and others um, to collect various categorical information, sort of de facto as part of research. Um, so given that, um, 
you know, there, there are potential benefits to categorization as well as risks. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, particularly for those communities, um, you know, better identifying disparities um, across those different groups, et cetera. You know, what, what kinds of rules or systems, um, you know, have you come across or that you think might be important to govern that practice? Yeah, well? this is a, a very good question. Um, and I honestly, a complex one, so complex that, for example, in our team, uh, we, we are writing a gender annotation document. So just like you mentioned, um, I talked about the harms of categorization, but at the same time, in order to test whether there's disparities in error rates among different populations, we have to have data about uh, categorized by people in specific populations, right? And so one of them is gender. Um, and, and, um, and, and this is, this, this comes back at, you know, who is looking at, um, at, at this, like one of the, uh, my, one of my direct reports is, uh, a trans woman and for her she thinks about gender all the time and how when people are categorized and what because she's had to think about this all the time the way in which i think about gender has was very different right and so i hadn't i didn't think i didn't think about it the way she thought about it so um it, this this goes at like you know this is this is basically like who has the power to to make what category so in terms of um the question that you just asked so because of this complexity, we wrote a gender annotation document with case studies for people who are actually making, uh, doing data set annotations. So we were, at, we were saying, okay, like when you're doing evaluation, like this aggregated testing, like I was um, talking about earlier, to try to see uh, subgroup testing, right? This aggregate by subgroups, what kinds of considerations should you have? Um, for, and then, you know, what about like uh, when you're like trying to train a classifier or something, what kind of considerations should you, should you have? So it, it, it took us like a long time to come to write this document and we're like doing interviews now just to make sure that we're not um, harming, you know, a certain group of people. And we're hoping to make this document um, actually like public so that maybe people, maybe it could be a guideline for like other types of categorization, you know, but it's, it's always a tension. I, I mean, like uh, there's the, the, there's a lot of works in specific types of fairness that show, for example, using um, the attribute, the specific subgroup uh, attribute can help you make things more fair. Of course, like there's so many different ways in which something can be fair or unfair. But at the same time, there's issues of privacy, right? Where, or an ownership and power where gathering demogra demographic data is, is an issue. Um, so in our team, we're also doing, we're also trying to figure out like ways in which we don't have to get um, demographic identity for people in, um, and still kind of do this disaggregated testing. I, I can talk more about that, but like we're experimenting with those things as well because there's a lot of issues with um, getting uh, demographic data. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments? I can't see the, the whether anybody's raising their hand, um, Suzanne, but I'm not sure if you see anyone. I don't see anyone. I'm here. I don't see anyone raising their hand. And uh, yeah, Christian, Christian. Christian. Go for it, Christian. Awesome. Um, thank you, Dr. Gabriel, for sharing your work. I found it really, really interesting. I have so many questions, but I'll start with um, one of the issues that you raised is a consent privacy concern. And I'm wondering how, if you've seen um, any attempts to design a consent process that is actually useful in this context, um, whether it's in the facial recognition area or another machine learning area. And if you've seen, and if you have, have you seen how those consent processes have handled with like concerns or, I have a concern about um, self-selection bias. I wonder like if you design your consent process in a way that is too rigorous, you might make it harder for the populations, the more vulnerable populations to actually yeah. participate in the research. And so I'm wondering how, if you've seen anything and if you've seen anything deal with that. You know, it's so fun. Like in a lot of these questions for me, it becomes a rabbit hole and it raises more questions. So I wrote this paper um, along with Joy and, and Deb because we did a lot of work on facial recognition auditing. And so we wrote this paper and we talked about ethical tensions 
and the ethical considerations. So ethical considerations for us were just like, okay, you should think about this. You should think about that as a consideration. And ethical tension was just like a tension that you cannot easily resolve. Like if you want this thing, you're going to harm this thing. And so you got to think about it. So, so this issue of consent that you bring up, yeah, there's also works that talk about, um, <laughs> that talk about um, while trying to increase representation in your, in, in your data or doing um, evaluation and, and subgroup um, uh, disaggregated testing, um, you can just get more data from disproportionately harm uh, people in underrepresented groups because you're trying to get a lot of data from them. So then there is like all of the issues of privacy, of power, whatever can get compounded because you're getting more data from them. But then at the same time, there's this other issue of data voids when if you don't get data from them, what happens as well? Um, and so this issue of consent that you're talking about, like I can, I can bombard someone um, if, if I, one of the things that a lot of lawyers, I guess I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so if you're a lawyer, correct me, talk about is a lot of um, terms of agreement. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're using all sorts, when, when we're using um, like, I don't know, apps and stuff, there's like terms of agreement and I just sign and, and I go, right? I don't, that doesn't give me power. It's not meaningful consent because it's very complicated. Um, I don't have time to just read and understand and, and whatever, but like companies, lawyers drafted this thing and they can change it whenever and they like, you know, I, I don't have the same resources. And so one of the things people talk about is making it really short. Um, and, and then there's this idea of informed consent, you know, continuous, what is it called? I don't remember, I think continuous informed consent, something like that, where make sure that someone is informed, but don't, don't make, don't bombard them with so much information that, um, that like, you know, they, they, they just sign and they don't really know what's going on. Um, and so I think like all the other issues, it's a very complex issue. And I think um, I, I haven't, I can't speak much about it because I wouldn't say that's my expertise. Uh, but I, I know enough to know that there are so many complexities and issues purely around consent. All right. Well, I'm afraid with that, we'll have to bring it to a close. We're a little bit um, over the hour, but thanks, Tim Nitt, for joining us um, today. Thanks to everyone else. Uh, and, thanks for uh, having me. We'll, um, we'll see everyone in, I guess, this is our last seminar of the, the